from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on John Alexander Lawson, otherwise known as Pazuzu. While I realize that he is not technically a serial killer as far as what we know right now, he nearly is, and this story is so completely bizarre, I just had to share it with you guys. The investigation is still ongoing, so he could be labeled a real serial killer in the future. I heard about him from a YouTuber by the name of Bailey Sarian, and I was pretty blown away. Bailey seems awesome, by the way, and she's beautiful too. Go check her channel out. Now I have to give you the disclaimer, disclaimer. This story will be graphic, and there's just not a lot of nice ways to describe some of the stuff he did. So there's that. Okay, here we go. John Alexander Lawson was born on August 12, 1978 in San Francisco, California. So as we do, let's get into some history for that time. The world population is estimated to have been about 4.4 billion people. Argentina hosted the World Cup and they also won. In 1978, earthquakes in Iran and Greece caused major destruction. The ongoing Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union brought on the ban of the newest computer technology to the Soviet Union. The world then sees three popes in one year. Pope Paul VI died at the age of 80. John Paul I takes over, but then dies 33 days later, ushering in Pope John Paul II. Roman Polanski, just hours before he was to be sentenced for rape and other charges against a child, flees to France. Sweden becomes the first country to ban aerosol sprays, though thought to damage the Earth's ozone layer. In the UK, the first what they called then test tube baby was born, conceived through in vitro fertilization. In June, serial killer David Berkowitz, aka the son of Sam, was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Also in 1978, Jim Jones, the leader of the cult People's Temple, ordered his followers to drink punch that was laced with poison in a mass suicide act. Some drank willingly, others were forced, and some were just shot. Jim Jones was found dead from a gunshot wound. So some other famous people born in 1978 were John Legend, Andy Samberg, James Franco, Ashton Kutcher, Kobe Bryant, and Josh Harnett. The average cost of a new house was about $55,000 or rent average $260 a month. The annual income was around $17,000. Gas was 63 cents a gallon and the eight track music player that was before cassette tapes and CDs, was about $170. 
So this was the atmosphere that John was born into. His parents were Timothy and Cynthia Lawson. They were young when they married in 1971. When John was born, his mother doted on him, taking many pictures of her adorable little boy. As an infant and small child, he is seen smiling in these photos and the smiles appear to be genuine. Cynthia stated in an interview that he was in the Cub Scouts, you know, she was the den leader. So when John was two years old, Timothy and Cynthia moved from San Francisco, California to Forsyth County, North Carolina, where Cynthia had grown up. For all intents and purposes, life was good. John played sports in school, baseball, and Mighty Mites football, and was considered a good young athlete, but he did have to repeat the second grade. There is some differing back and forth information regarding when his parents were actually separated, but in 1990, when John was 11 to 12 years old, his parents were officially divorced. Some sources, such as the Viceland docuseries, say his mother began raising him as a single mother when he was just five years old. It is known that Timothy and Cynthia didn't get along very well, and his father moved back to California. John and Cynthia stayed in Clemens, North Carolina. A neighbor and babysitter named Carmen described John when he was very young as a sad child, though he was a nice kid. She babysat him from the ages of five to nine years old. Carmen said that John liked to pretend to be a vampire wearing fake teeth and a black cape. She also stated that he loved horror films such as Friday the 13th and so on. Apparently, at the age of eight, he started being verbally and physically abusive toward his mother, so she somehow was able to get him admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Carmen states that she visited him at this facility, but that she wholeheartedly believed that John had no business being in that hospital. Now at the time, Cynthia was known to be a pretty heavy drinker, and well, let's just say she went out on a lot of dates, you know, chasing men, and left John alone when he was really too young to be left alone. It is reported that he began to torture and kill animals, and he began to try drugs and alcohol at the age of 13. He kept failing grades and had to repeat them, another one being his freshman year. The docuseries stated that he was a 19-year-old freshman, actually. One of his classmates, who was also a neighbor, stated that the kids called him, quote, turd boy, because he apparently smelled like human feces. He basically just quit going to school and dropped out his, you know, freshman year. The kids that he was friends with were toxic at best, and yet his mother did nothing to deter him from hanging out with them. John's personality then became really dark. He began to dress differently, his physical appearance changing, he was acting strange. One of his friends got him to try methamphetamine. So at first, Cynthia admits that she turned a blind eye, but she eventually again took him to a psychiatrist who diagnosed him with agoraphobia, schizophrenia, and manic depression. But the level of help that John needed, as we all know it can be, got very expensive very quickly, and she just wasn't able to keep up with it. And that's what we have for John's childhood, so let's unpack. I couldn't find any background information on either of his parents, other than they were young and that they didn't really get along. Now, whether or not that means there was any domestic abuse or any of that sort, we don't know. 
At least not yet. My instincts tell me that there wasn't though. John's mother was interviewed and I don't recall her ever even hinting at that. His mother also signed him up for school sports, so he was at least involved in after-school activities, which can be rewarding for most children. But what sticks out to me is that his babysitter described him as nice, but sad. Then he began being abusive toward his mother. The babysitter stated that his mother was chasing men drinking heavily and leaving John unattended for periods of time when he began to have issues. Kids who are only children, whose mothers spend a lot of time out at the bars drinking and having many, many boyfriends, and especially having those men around that child, will have a very negative effect on that kid. I know this firsthand. Now, I understand that being a single parent is not easy. It requires much of that parent, but it is vitally important that they put the child's needs far above their own if they want their child to grow up feeling safe and secure. Heavy drinking, hanging out in dive bars, having multiple sexual partners in and out of the house forces the child to have to grow up too fast. It makes them hyper aware of things that they're just not mentally mature enough to understand. It will most often negatively influence their decision making. Sometimes it even makes the child feel like there has been a role reversal. The child then becomes the parent and vice versa. There is just a whole host of negative things the child experiences. Cynthia's priority should have been her son and not, quote, having a good time. So as John began displaying troubling behaviors and failing school, he was admitted to an inpatient mental health facility. Now, we don't have the whole story about what Cynthia told the health care provider to get her son committed. We just know that it happened. We don't know what he was specifically diagnosed with either at this first setting. John later began torturing and killing animals and his mother was aware of this. Now acts of cruelty to animals are symptomatic of a deep mental disturbance. We know this. Research shows that people who commit acts of cruelty to animals rarely ever stop there. Many of them go on to harm humans. We, we know this, guys. Many studies show a correlation between children that abuse animals with violent and aggressive criminals. So even though his mother was, in my opinion, wrong for displaying some of the behaviors that she did in front of him, we clearly see that he showed signs of serious mental health issues as well. We also see that he began drinking and doing drugs. Most often, teens act out what they see. John sees his mother drinking heavily, so he assumes that this behavior is acceptable. Teens also use and abuse substances as a way to escape or self-medicate. His mother flat out said that she just looked the other way. And then, in his later teens, we see he was still just a freshman in high school, having to repeat grades. His mother said that he just didn't go to school. Again, this is neglectful parenting. And we hear from a peer who was also a nearby neighbor that he smelled of human feces at school. And of course the other kids would find this wholly repellent. My research into his childhood didn't explain why he smelled so bad, but as we get further into the story, you will understand why. Then finally, his mother took him to another mental health official who diagnosed him with agoraphobia, schizophrenia, and manic depression. Now many of us already know the seriousness of these labels, but let's quickly review. 
Agoraphobia is an anxiety disorder that displays as fear and avoidance of places and situations that might cause feelings of panic, entrapment, helplessness, embarrassment, and so on. Most people associate this with the fear of leaving their house. Schizophrenia is a long-term mental disorder involving a disconnect between thought, emotion, and behavior, which can lead to auditory and visual hallucinations, disjointed or disorganized speech, displaying inappropriate actions or feelings, and mental fragmentation. Now, later we find out that this diagnosis was changed to something else, which I believe is more accurate, which is schizotypal personality disorder. This disorder shows symptoms such as being a loner and lacking close friends, flat emotion, or inappropriate emotional responses, persistent and excessive social anxiety, false interpretation of events, eccentric or unusual beliefs or mannerisms, paranoid thoughts, believing that one has special powers, having bad personal hygiene and appearing unkempt, and also a peculiar style of speech or rambling oddly during conversations. Now, the difference between schizophrenia and schizotypal personality disorder very long story short, is that schizophrenics during their delusions generally cannot be swayed away from their delusions and are not aware of their psychosis, while schizotypal personalities come in and out and can be made aware of the differences in reality compared to what they're experiencing. And then finally, manic depression, which is now called bipolar disorder. It manifests as extreme mood swings that include emotional highs or mania and then lows or depression. During the manic phase, they usually feel euphoric, you know, full of energy and unusually irritable. This affects sleep patterns, energy levels, judgment, behavior, and the ability to think clearly and in some cases, the quote roller coaster can trigger psychosis. So we see that he had some very serious mental health issues, a mother who was neglectful at best, and financial constraints that made it nearly impossible to put and keep John on the medications and along the therapy path that he would need for the rest of his life. So let's get back into it. After dropping out of high school, he legally changed his name to Pazuzu Ila Algarod. He studied and became a devout Satanist and drug dealer. And side note, in case you don't know who Pazuzu is, he's the demon from the exorcist, but is also a bit more. Pazuzu, though evil himself, also drives away other evil spirits and in a way protects humans against plague and misfortune. He was also thought of as the king of the demons of the wind, the bearer of storms and drought, and is often shown as a hybrid of human and animal parts. He has the body of a human male, reproductive organs and all, but his head is usually a lion or a dog, and he has the talons of an eagle, he has wings, he has a scorpion's tail, and he is always depicted with his right hand up and his left hand down. So in 1998, when John was 20 years old, Cynthia remarried to a man named Johnny and the family moved into this infamous house at 2749 Knob Hill Drive in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, I'm not going to call him Pazuzu throughout this podcast. It just seems kind of silly to me. I'm just going to keep calling him John. So needless to say, John really hated his stepfather. 
completely loathed him actually and screamed at him and demanded that his mother divorce him to choose her son over her husband. So at least Cynthia convinced her husband to leave. But he loved how uncomfortable he made other people. He bragged about being a Satanist, which of course would be very upsetting to the local Christian community. He also began getting a lot of tattoos, such as the word Satan across one of his forearms, as well as a lot of facial tattoos and so on. He called himself a male witch. He claimed he could control the weather. Now remember the schizotypal. He grew his hair out long, he dreaded it. He took a Dremel tool and filed his teeth down to points himself. He split his tongue so that it appeared to be forked. One of his former classmates said that he displayed himself in the most shocking way he thought he could in his community. He wanted to be the bad guy. John told acquaintances that his father had never wanted him. But then again, he told people that his father was dead. John told others that he wanted to kill himself. He would make this normal conversation. He explained that he could kill himself in the Kurt Cobain fashion with a shotgun. He said he could slit his wrists in the bathtub. John also stated that he really looked up to and respected Charles Manson for how he was able to sort of form his own cult and have people follow him like he did as well as being able to get his followers to do bad things on his behalf. Then after the 9-11 attacks, he tried to convince people that he was an Iraqi Muslim. He started dressing that way. He said he was a quote, self-styled combination of Charles Manson, Anton LaVey, and Aleister Crowley, unquote. Another side note, if you guys want me to do a podcast on Aleister Crowley, let me know. It would be pretty disturbing, but leave me a DM on Instagram or a comment on YouTube or email me. You guys know the drill. So anyway, John decided to sort of create his own religion where he wanted to combine Luciferianism beliefs with the Islamic religion. Of course, it never really was organized or anything. He didn't put a lot of thought into it, but he began to try to recruit people to join his church. He targeted other troubled teens, young adults, and others that he knew he could easily pull in his direction. Of course, his promises of drugs, sex, and quote, no rules was a powerful attraction. He was still living in his mother's home, mind you, though she was in and out. Basically, it was John's house at this point, and he was inviting these people over to his house to practice his new religion. And these people loved his ideas and how he basically couldn't care less about society or what authority figures thought. Then John began sacrificing animals and drinking their blood with his new followers. He claimed eating the still beating heart of an animal gave him a rush better than drugs and he continued this monthly practice. He talked about how he committed human sacrifice as well as cannibalism. He bragged about burying bodies in his backyard. He said that he, at most, took a bath once a year. He had women followers, of course, and he referred to them as his fiancés, and they willingly slept with him. He said he hadn't brushed his teeth in years. He told people that in his house, there were, again, no rules. So people tore up the house, drew all over the walls. You know, John orchestrated drug-fueled orgies, and people would just squat down in the corner and defecate on the floor. Yeah, I know. John and his people would do heroin or meth together, self-harm, or cut each other. 
It was just other filth and chaos in this house. The stench coming from that house, from the dead and rotting animals, the human waste and just general debauchery was unimaginable. The neighbors could smell it. But he was excited about all of this because he was the leader of these people. He was in charge. Now keep in mind that his mother was at least around and aware of what was happening in that house and yet she did nothing. And in fact, it has been reported that she bought some of the animals he sacrificed and just handed them right over. She continued to pay the bills, she bought him beer daily, she bought his cigarettes, and so on. Some of his followers, of course, lived in that house with him. One fiancé was a girl named Amber Birch, whom he called Bubbles. She had been thought of as a normal, healthy young girl, but once she met John, she quickly began adopting his lifestyle. Another close fiancé was Crystal Matlock, with a similar background to Amber's. So, in 2008, when John was 30 years old, he was arrested for larceny, which is theft of personal property, and he was put on probation for a few years. This should mean that he would have been at least somewhat monitored during that time by law enforcement. He was already on their radar as it was, of course. In 2009, John shot and killed Joshua Wetzler, who was 32 at the time. Now, Joshua had been a straight-laced young man who had a great girlfriend and a child. They had traveled together and their wish was to own a ranch where they could train horses. But they fell on hard times and Joshua resorted to selling drugs and had been busted. So it isn't known if drugs are how Joshua crossed paths with John, but regardless, John shot Joshua three times in the head, then an additional four or five shots to the torso. Then, with help, John buried the body in his backyard. Now, someone did call the police to report that there was a body in the backyard, but the police, for whatever reason, blew it off and didn't follow up. Now, several months later, Amber shot and killed 31-year-old Tommy Welch. John, Amber, and others buried his body in the backyard. Because the rumors went around that he was a drug dealing murderer, he got off on that attention and he bragged that he had murdered others. In early 2010, Joshua's girlfriend called the police, stating she had been told that her boyfriend had been murdered by John and that his body was buried in the backyard. Finally, the police came to the residence. I'm assuming they did not go inside to see the blood smeared walls and feces everywhere and just went around back to have a look. They apparently saw nothing suspicious and left even though there were obviously disturbed earth areas in at least two places. Then later in 2010, Cynthia and John got into an argument and John began to strangle his own mother until she passed out. It is also reported that Amber, you know, one of his fiancés, also attacked Cynthia. But once his mother regained consciousness, she called the police and he was then arrested. The authorities asked her if she wanted to press charges, but she declined to, stating she was, quote, fearful of her son's behavior and religious practices." Unquote. During this police report, she told the authorities that there were dead bodies in the backyard, and still nothing. In 2011, John was arrested for the suspected murder of Joseph Chandler, whose body was found on the bank of the local river where John held some of his sacrificial rituals. 
at this time, John actually wasn't the killer, it was one of his followers, but regardless, it was discovered that the friend did it and John was charged with accessory and only given, get this, further probation. He was court ordered to have a psychiatric evaluation as well as a medical evaluation and the court document shows that he had the following panic disorder with agoraphobia, alcoholism and withdrawal symptoms at the time of the eval, schizotypal personality disorder, alcoholic hepatitis, high cholesterol, macrocytosis, which is the enlargement of red blood cells sometimes caused from a vitamin B12 deficiency or liver disease, though it was most likely caused from subclinical hypothyroidism. That is basically a condition where the body doesn't produce enough thyroid hormones. They also noted his lack of personal hygiene and stench. After this evaluation, he was prescribed medication and deemed sane enough to assist in his own defense laughable and what that means is they determined that he was not sick or disturbed enough by any of his existing illnesses or his situation to impair his ideas of right and wrong because of course so finally in 2014 after receiving countless tips complaints and reports the police finally decided to search the property again. There, one of John's friends pointed out two places where he believed bodies had been buried. In October 2014, the skeletal remains of two bodies were found buried in shallow graves in John and Cynthia's backyard. The bodies were later identified as belonging to Joshua and Tommy and they had been murdered five years before. John was arrested and charged with the murder of Joshua and accessory to the murder of Tommy. Amber was charged with the murder of Tommy and an accessory to Joshua. Crystal was just charged with accessory and received three years. Now, Amber stated that she was addicted to drugs and didn't understand right from wrong at the time and also suffered from Stockholm Syndrome and felt she had no choice but to help with the murders. And for those that don't know, Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological response where a captive begins to identify closely with his or her captors along with their agenda and demands. Somehow, I highly doubt that. She was sentenced to a minimum of 30 years. While being held in prison for a year and getting treatment for his mental illnesses, he was housed in secure custody. So keep in mind, he was getting treatment, he was getting medication. So he should have been at least somewhat clear-headed at the time. But the night before his trial, he literally bit his forearm open and bled out on the floor, thus killing himself. He was 37 years old. Now, I saw that he supposedly had a son with one of his prior fiancés, but I'm not 100% on that, and it was said that he had nothing to do with this child. So, while he's not technically considered a serial killer, this is still being investigated, of course, and it is thought that he killed more people. If you are curious at all, I highly suggest you Google this man. The pictures of the inside of the house are, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't know how anyone could live in that. Take a look if you want. Um, there's actually police video of the walkthrough of his house on YouTube. So in summation, John's downward spiral was fast and intense. Raised by a mom who loved him, but was too involved in her own selfish lifestyle to take control of her son. 
While she did seek mental health intervention for him on occasion in his youth, the money just wasn't there. And I think we can all relate to that. But she was aware of and often lived in the conditions of that house, knowing full well what was going on. She was an enabler, and she admitted in an interview that she was there when those two men were murdered, and yet she did nothing because she thought he would shoot her. And I'm not saying that she's 100% to be blamed for his actions. And since he suffered with some very serious mental illness, I'm not sure he can be 100% blamed either. It also didn't help that the police turned a blind eye on what they basically knew what was going on in that house. In my opinion, this is a collection of people who were at fault in a situation that could have been dealt with years and years before it ever got to that point before anyone was murdered. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. My website is serialkilling.squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes a lot of time to put these together, but I love it. And thank you so very much for listening. I appreciate all of you because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. And a year into my podcast existence, I am still blown away. Have a great day.